Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Steinberg Hallian 7 tutorial series. Today we're going to have a look at the subject of mapping. This is all about assigning different samples uh, to a layer, to a program layer, depending upon the chromatic note that we play on the keyboard and also, or alternatively, how hard we hit that key. So there are two different metrics by which mapping can be assigned. Hope you're enjoying the series so far and if you are, please check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below or some way to help support me. Now we're going to be having a look at multiple presets today, but we're going to start with a very simple one, our good old friend Hexagon. And I'm going to jump over to the mapping editor. Here's one of the problems that we have when viewing multi-layer programs. Multiple different things can happen when you press a single key. As we've already seen previously, the Hexagon preset is made up of three different layers and they all play simultaneously. This makes for a very confusing visual representation of what's happening when we press any individual key. Let's play a C3. You can see that the keyboard auto highlighted, so it's representing what key I just played. You can also see in the master keyboard, everything's synced together here. So what's happening is that this key over here is representing everything that's happening there, but it's actually pretty difficult to make out really what's going on. I'm gonna scroll up with my mouse wheel so that I can zoom into this key. There are multiple different ways that you can zoom in the mapping editor. And the zooming editor is a little bit unusual uh, for this screen because it's bi-directional. We can scroll both horizontally and vertically. I'll demonstrate that a little bit later. It's not particularly useful at the moment because we don't have any velocity layers. But I've zoomed in on C3 here and it's really difficult to actually see what's happening because all three layers are basically obscuring each other. That's what the eyeball symbol is all about. Now we've already had a bit of a look at the hexagon preset and we know that Anima and Skylab are generative layers. They basically use engines to make their sound, whereas Studio Strings is sample based. We don't particularly want to see Anima or Skylab. They're not remotely interesting from the mapping perspective because the entire layer is assigned to the entire keyboard. So let's throw them both away. And now we get a much clearer view of the stuff that we're actually interested in. We're only interested in seeing the Studio Strings layer. I'll open up that layer so we can see all the individual samples. And now you can see that this sample says Full Strings Romantic C3. Now you can kind of scroll down and find that. Here it is, there's the C3 um, sample. When I clicked that sample, it also highlighted the zone and you can do that in either direction. If I click in a zone, then it auto highlights or selects the sample. There are multiple different ways by which you can navigate this mapping editor. How do you want the mouse and the keyboard and the visual interface to interact and respond to your inputs? Up at the top left hand corner of the mapping editor, we've got this button called Enable MIDI Mapping Selection Options. And if we open that, there's a whole raft of stuff that enables us to be a little bit more controlled about how all this stuff occurs. For the moment, let's just have a look at one of them, Select Zones via MIDI. At the moment, that's enabled so if I press C4 it just selected C4 for me C3 and we're back down here now we won't worry about the other options just yet I don't want to get too deep on the minutiae before we've had an overview of what's actually happening here just inadvertently scrolled in with my very sensitive mouse wheel there sorry about that so anyway here's full strings romantic C3 but it isn't just C3 if I press C sharp 3 it's still playing the same sample. Can you see that nothing happened? I've got MIDI selection enabled here, but when I played C sharp, it's still playing the C3 sample. If I play D3, that's a different story, but C sharp is playing the C sample tuned up a semitone. And that's really the heart of sample players. They take a single tonal sound and they're capable of tuning it chromatically so that it can be played across a range of keys. The quality of a sample based program in Hallian or any other sample player is generally determined by how many samples are used to define that sound. Now in the SE libraries, you'll typically get two, three, maybe even four notes being covered with a single sample because frankly, they're like the economy version of the sample sounds. When we have a look at a couple of the other presets that we'll go on to have a look at later in the full blown versions of the sample, you'll see that there's much greater detail in the sample libraries, which makes them bigger, costs more money to actually record all of those sounds with very high quality 
obviously, you know, the, the better quality of thing, the more expensive, the more valuable it's going to be. These SE versions, perfectly normal and totally acceptable, actually, to have a couple of notes covered by the same sample. Yes, there's an element of budget to it, but it's really not significantly damaging the sound. They still sound very good. Let's solo the studio strings layer so we can really hear what's going on. Now, obviously, we've got other effects going on here. The, the sound's going through the entire layer. But we're essentially hearing what is primarily the sample there. When we jump across and listen to the raw sample itself, it's going to sound fairly similar to that. So that's the underlying sample, that's what you're really hearing, and then layer, um, effects are being layered over the top of it. When we play the C-sharp 3, you're hearing exactly the same sample, simply tuned up a semitone. Now these mapping ranges can be adjusted. I've just taken my mouse out of infinity mode because it's, it's basically far too sensitive for this job. This sample player is really sensitive to mouse wheel scrolling, so we shouldn't have any more problems now. Okay, back to the discussion. Let's manipulate a couple of these mapping zones. I'll select the D3 zone, and when I hover over the left-hand junction, my cursor changes. I can now pick up that window and start dragging it to the left and right. So if I drag it over onto C sharp 3, I've now overlapped those two notes. In other words, when I press the C sharp three, two different samples are gonna sound now. Watch the editor. So both C3 and D3 samples are being played, but you're only hearing C sharp. The tuner is perfectly happy identifying that note as a C sharp. Hallian knows what the pitch of those two samples is. We tell it via this command called root key, that's the fundamental pitch of the tone that's being played. And then if I'm playing a note that's other than that pitch, Hallian will do the detuning for me. So you don't hear this discordant minor second thing going on. It's actually playing the correct note on both samples. Now with the higher pitched sample selected, you can see that the root of that note is D3. So it's being detuned by one semitone when I press the C sharp. If I select the lower sample underneath, you can see here that the root is C3. Now for today's purposes, we're discussing the use of the mapping editor itself. In a later video, we'll have a look at importing samples into Hallian. But it is important to note that samples have root information embedded in the file. The sample itself stores what its root key is. And when they're imported into a sampler, that information can be read. And so you get a lot of this stuff for free. You can, however, manually edit it. If I make this lower sample root off C sharp three and I play the C sharp, now we've got that discordant thing. The tuner no longer knows what's going on because it's playing two separate notes simultaneously. Time to move on to a new example. Just loaded up a new program called Saw 1 to 5. It's in the uh, SE Basic library. And this lets us have a look at the mapping editor from a slightly different perspective. If I expand the tree, you'll see that this is uh, a stereo program so we have two layers but the layers are interested in the left and right hand sides if i press a key on the keyboard you see that two different samples are being played from each of the layers if i make one of those sides invisible let's uh let's shut down the left hand side now you can only see the right hand side in the editor and if i click let's click f3 you'll see that now it's only visually representing it's only selecting one of those two samples Still playing the left hand sample. It's just not auto selecting it. These numbers in the samples, by the way, aren't velocities. They're, well, I want to say they're MIDI notes, but there's great confusion and debate of, of whether or not um, MIDI note 60 is C3 or C4. As far as this uh, particular sample set's concerned, 60 is corresponding to C3. So don't be confused by thinking these are supposed to be velocity mappings, they're not. They're jumping up in blocks of 12 because they're chromatic steps over the course of an octave. Now, while we've got fairly large sample ranges to work with, each of these samples, 60 and 72, are operating over an entire octave. This is a good opportunity for me to demonstrate crossfading. This is where we have two adjacent samples that overlap. In other words, they're both playing simultaneously, but we can fade from one to another to blur out any artifacts that there may be between the two different samples. The whole point of multi-sampling is that every sample is going to be a different acoustic characteristic of the, of the thing that you're sampling. What I'm going to do in this example 
is spread these two samples, the 60 and 72, across exactly the same key range and crossfade between them as we play up the two octaves. The first thing that we need to do is to expand both of the key mappings so that they cover the same area of keyboard. It's a little bit tricky to get to the 72 version now. You can do it from the program tree. I press the control key on my keyboard. I can multi-select both samples. And now just those samples have been selected. I can drag that to the left. And as soon as I do, can you see Hallian immediately snaps all four samples into view. It's saying everything is playing over the same zone. And so I can represent it that way visually. Now we don't want both samples to play at full volume. Every time I press a key, that's gonna increase all of the, the average volume and we don't want that at all. Now we need to introduce crossfading. A crossfading is implemented on a zone by zone basis. So I'm gonna make sure that I've got all four zones selected. Again, pressing the control key down on my keyboard to multi-select. And then I right click in the editor, enable crossfading on the keyboard axis. We're not interested in velocity at the moment. So crossfading is now being enabled for all four of those zones. The next thing that I need to do is just select the 60s. So this is the lower version of the sample. I've got these little crossfade boxes at the top. Pick one of those up, drag it to the left. So now only the lowest note is going to play at full volume. The note the sound's going to get progressively quieter. I can pick up this velocity curve. This is going to be a mix to taste kind of affair. I'll just set it all the way up to maximum for now and not worry too much about how accurate that is. Then I'll go over to my 72s and do the opposite. I only want to hear that at full volume on the right hand side of the range. Again, change my power curve. So if we make the 72s invisible, and if I mute them as well, you'll hear the 60 get quieter. all the way up to the top where it was silent. Let's flip the visibility. So we're now just looking at 72s. So I'm, I'm flipping not only the visibility state, but also the mute state. So now we're only gonna hear the 72s when we play over that range. Oops. Getting progressively quieter all the way down to nothing. Bring everything in. And now a perfectly seamless crossfade between those two samples. You can't identify where one starts and the other one ends. Now I'm loading up a new preset now. I've not been able to find one in the SE libraries that does everything I want. So I'm stepping up into the full version of Hallian now. This is a, a, pre, a program called Piano Bar. And if you happen to stumble across a velocity layered preset in the SE libraries, please drop a note in the comments so that, so that people who wanna follow along with just the SE version can do so, but I've not been able to find one, unfortunately. This is the Piano Bar preset. I've got a pretty complex multi-layered program here. So we've got a bright concert piano. It's jumping around, auto-selecting everything at the moment. So I'll just leave it in that mode. What else have we got? Got tremolo strings. And we've also got synth bass. So following this in the mapping editor becomes increasingly complex. The more sample based libraries that you have, the more difficult it is to follow along with what's going on in the mapping editor. And you re really need to be focused on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So when I press that C3, it's focused in on the synth bass synth zone, which is spread across the entire keyboard. Not interested in seeing that. In fact, for the moment, I'm gonna focus in on the concert piano. And let's solo it as well. Okay, here's my C3 playing a single note on this particular sample. And this is what I'm talking about. The, the, great, the higher the quality sample library, the more, the more samples you're gonna have. So on a single key here, we have, what is that, eight different samples being played depending on the velocity. Now, if I want to hear any one of those individual samples, it's quite tricky to do. If I play a very quiet note, you can see this orange box. The orange box represents the currently focused sample. So it's this little one here, slightly louder. 
Here we go. And you can see this green line indicating how hard I've hit the key. That's all very well and good. But if I want to work on a single sample, let's say I want to work on this sample that I just clicked in. Well, it's hard to do that with the keyboard because I need to kind of keep going until I get to the right velocity. You can actually override the keyboard velocity and assign a different controller instead. We have this option called Select Zones using a MIDI controller to set the velocity. Beautiful title. I think it's almost impossible from that pop-up to figure out what's going on here. But if I engage it and start messing with the modulation wheel, it should be pretty obvious what's happening quite quickly. So I turn the mod wheel all the way down. You can see it at the bottom left-hand corner of the, the, uh, the virtual keyboard. Now, as I turn the mod wheel up, you can see a yellow line tracking where my mod wheel is. See that yellow line on the left-hand side of the interface? That's the sample that's going to get represented. The, the keyboard velocity has now been overridden and we're using modulation wheel input instead. So there's the, the sample I wanted to hear. And now every time I press a key, regardless of how quiet, playing it as quiet as I possibly can and as loud as I possibly can, doesn't matter. I'm always getting the 94 sample. So that's a really nice feature. Would never have thought to implement that. It's really cool. You can override keyboard velocity and use your mod wheel instead. Just a very quick mention, you can also crossfade velocities. Now I'll do a ridiculous example here just for the purpose of illustration. I'm going to select one sample, drag it down, and then manually select the other sample, drag that up. And there you go. Now both samples have been represented. They're covering the same zone. Right click crossfades. I can enable velocity crossfading now. And now as I drag this down, you can see that little green line indicating the velocity crossfade exactly as in the previous example. So I won't go any further with that, but it's just to show you that crossfading can be accomplished in both directions. Now that we've got a much more complicated program to deal with, I can show you the bi-directional zooming. So here's me zooming in vertically. And now I've got a scroll bar up and down and scrolling in horizontally. Scroll left and right. As you can see, you need to be pretty passionate about sample mapping to go down to the absolute minutiae of, of programming each one of these individual samples. Let's zoom back out fully again. If I select an area, I can press S at the bottom right hand corner, zoom to selection, and it'll do that. And we've got three temporary memory stores. So if I zoom back into that selected zone, there we go. And hover over this number one, it says this is a recall button, but shift click to save. So shift click. Now zoom out and click one, zoom back in again. Finally, today we'll have a look at auto assigning some mapping ranges. For this, I'm gonna go back to the saw one to five example we had a look at a little bit earlier, because it's got nice big ranges to play with. So this sample zone that we're looking at here operates between A sharp two and B three, but it does have a sample center. Its root is C three. I select this mapping zone, right click, I have some mapping options. So if I select root key only, now only C three will make any noise. There's C three, C, C sharp three is silent. The standard mapping, the one that will get you closest to where you're likely to want to be, is root key fill centered. So this orients the sampled note on the correct root key. C3 has been assigned to C3 and it's filled the entire range as much as possible with the same sample that's got us back to where we wanted to be. Fill up and fill down, pretty self-explanatory. Started at C3 and filled up, leaving this gap below. You can also velocity layer samples. Now it doesn't make any sense in this context. I'll do it anyway, but it won't make much sense because both samples are 0 to 127. But if I say layered on root key and zoom in a bit, you can see that it's assigned left to the bottom half of the velocity range and right to the top half. Get back to key fill centered, which is the right one and zoom fully out. It's left this one layer split as you can see. It doesn't matter because I'm throwing it away anyway. Did I say finally earlier? Shouldn't have said finally, because there's another thing to look at. Finally, finally, auditioning samples. I'm gonna press C3 on the keyboard. Press C3 in the editor. Press the control key down and press C3 in the editor. It 
chromatically plays all the samples until you let go of the mouse. If I press Ctrl and Alt and click C3, it's going to play the velocity layered versions of those notes as well. It'll play 10 different velocities per key. Just need to hide the synth bass, it's breaking my example. Okay, Control, Alt, click. So it's playing 10 different versions of every note. You can see it scrolling at the top through all of the various velocity ranges as well. So if you've built a very complex program like this one, it's a really good way of auditioning every sample in the library because it's going to play all of those velocity ranges for every single key. And you don't have to worry about individually clicking every, every single one of them. Bit of a marathon session today, cup of tea in order. Hope you enjoyed it. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.